Hi, um, it's uh, nice to be here eventually. I've been a, a previous customer of WSO2 uh, before I joined them in January this year. And uh, there's been a, a lot of attempts to get me to do a talk, so uh, now I'm employed by them, I don't really have a choice. <laughs> um, this is the first time I've done this, so uh, bear with me if I'm a bit, uh, a bit nervous. Uh, so, the title around uh, the key to unleash power of microservices is what does API management mean in a microservice architecture? Uh, how do we um, use and uh, what advantages does it, does it gain? So I'm going to go through uh, some, uh, some basics here. So for any grandmas in the audience, I'm going to teach you how to suck some eggs. So do bear with me. So why microservices? Um, well, we've got a lot of these still hanging around our monolithic applications. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of people in the audience who have worked with them, interacted with them, and like myself, probably built a few. Uh, and they're still around, and they're still probably going to be around for some time. Uh, so within the modern challenges of the sort of technology evolution and what businesses need to do to adapt uh, to uh, changing markets and um, accelerated innovation, this style just didn't work. Um, you get uh, a lot of them may follow good development practices, uh, sound a bit old here, object orientation, if some of you remember some of that. I was, you know, it used to be a very uh, common phrase. I don't hear it uh, much anymore, but, you know, you might have very well-defined, well-developed application, but it's still a monolith. Um, release comp compilation testing was still a big effort, uh, and you couldn't um, do it in an agile, um, agile manner. So, Scaling is also uh, potentially difficult. If the app, uh, monolith allowed, you can potentially um, load balance against multiple instances, but it was a release of the whole stack. Whether it was one function or one component that needed to scale, everything had to, had to scale. So we can't make the horse go any faster. So let's, uh, you know, we need a new approach. Let's break it down. Let's do SOA. I mean, sorry, microservices. Um, <laughs> so what does that mean? Um, and here's another egg to suck. So characters of microservices, a lot of you are probably uh, familiar with those. So microservices have been developed to uh, do a, a finer granularity of componentization, independence, enable us to utilize modern um, hosting, development, CICD processes, uh, modern agile delivery methodologies. So, you know, the component means that you need to make it independent, uh, so you can release and change it as fast as you need. It needs to, um, <coughs> needs to do one thing. So, you know, what that thing is, is a matter of discussion. The granularity of microservices uh, can vary depending on what, uh, what environment you're in and how far on your transformation journey uh, you may be. Um, I've seen uh, architectures on uh, other industries where they have seven microservices. Not particularly micro, <laughs> but uh, they use that, uh, used some of the elements to start to create these sort of bounded contexts and uh, componentize their environment a bit better. Looked more sort of old server style to me, but you know they, they like to call it microservices. Um, so that single responsibility say is is something that you know you need to establish yourself. Um, they tend to be trying to make them business focused, not technology. So you don't have a stack of microservices that do all your. Um, tax return calculations, you don't have one that, so I'm showing my uh, previous employer there, uh, you don't have one that uh, does all your, um, uh, that is all your Java services. You tend to focus on um, business related functions. So things like uh, auction houses, raids, talents, battlegrounds, uh, the geeks out there will know what I mean, or more boringly, orders, products, shipping, those sort of functions. So, um, also, 
you want to aim for no centralized organization. Um, smart endpoints dumb pipes. Your services should know how they communicate with the world, what they need to communicate with, whether that's via sort of command control pattern or whether via events. Um, that's to, uh, you know, uh, for you guys to work out. Um, but again, in this area, the dependency element needs to be considered. You've got to make, you try and make them as independent as possible. And obviously, um, with them having to know about other systems and services, you're slowly building up those dependencies again. So it's, again, it's a, it's a, it's a tricky balancing act there. Um, and it says mandatory CICD. You don't have to do it if you're a small, um, small outfit and you've got you know a few dozen microservices you could probably manage without a robust CICD pipeline it's not essential however as it gets bigger and you want um, you know more control and you're going from tens to hundreds of microservices a, a robust CICD pipeline using automation uh, is essential So, on the uh, boring example, here's some uh, view of a microservice uh, architecture. Looks, as again, as I said, looks pretty simple. You know, you, if that was all your services your organization had to run, wouldn't be a big issue. Um, but I say, scale that to tens, hundreds. That map's going to start to look a bit more chaotic. Uh, might even hark back to some of the spaghetti diagrams you used to see before we introduced the likes of SOA and stuff like that. Um, and, you know, it gives you some potential issues. Uh, so one of those is, you know, you're going to have more internal and external facing microservices and you may need to distinguish between them because of various, uh, various factors. So. Um, you might have you know, the idea of the microservices, actually it doesn't matter what you develop them in. Okay, they're within a framework and you should be developing to nice robust interfaces. Um, but, you know, you might get um, <clears throat> non-uniformity across your different teams using different technologies. And also uh, security. Um, the different microservices for different functions are going to have different needs around security. If they're facing external clients or applications of third parties, you may be using OAuth, OIDC, uh, those sort of um, mechanisms. Or internally, you might just be using mutual TLS uh, for service communication. So all of those differences starts to muddy the waters around that one function of the microservice if it has to deal with all of that itself. So a few other things, you know, enforcing quality of services, rate limiting caching, um, analytics, business insights, and sort of in general, um, you know, governance of your microservices. So, again, all of those things not necessarily a big problem if, if you're, you're at a small scale, but as you scale up, as it becomes more business critical, uh, those issues are going to give you more and more pain. So, and you can end up uh, in a situation, uh, it's one of the things that I was uh, always very concerned with, around adopting microservices um, in a previous role. If you're not careful, you end up with a big black box of microservices. Lots of people know lots of different bits, but no one really knows the whole, and it just becomes another version of a monolith. Which, unpicking that, could give you yeah, a bit easier, but it still give you a lot of pain, um, like we're going through now, getting, uh, trying to move away from our old uh, platforms. So, role of APIs uh, in a microservice architecture. Um, so, each of the microservices has got its own interface. It's an API. How do you, uh, what can we do to um, help uh, support and manage that? So, one of the options uh, you've got um, is using your uh, API gateways. You can have different gateways for different functions, internal, uh, external um, services, which gives you the good capability of separation of concerns, um, role-based access to uh, development, deployment, 
capabilities. I'm sure Nuon went through some of those on uh, what's available on the WC2 platform. Um, and that sort of removes some of the uh, potential complexity and removes some of the responsibility of what a microservices might need to uh, do or um, have built into it. So this also gives you the option uh, to assist in migrating away from uh, your legacy monolith applications and break them down into uh, microservices. Um, so here we use an external uh, gateway to front all the functions of the monolith while we've extracted and um, isolated the product's microservice into its own, um, uh, own, own setup, uh, but we've still got the rest of the functions in the monolith. To the consumers, they don't see any different. Um, it's a pattern that some of you have probably seen a few times. Um, personally, uh, I did this initially on some systems with an ESB first, uh, but that lacked the full capabilities of the API management and government systems. So then you can use the uh, API gateway as well. It was one of the issues uh, that we talked about around API um, capabilities orchestration. So if you're going through that process of um, disaggregating your monolith, uh, you've got to do some orchestration. Now, ideally, you shouldn't be doing that in the API gateway to any great extent. In a transitional architecture, you're very likely to need to do that. So you can uh, use your API layer to do that orchestration. Uh, you can um, do the sort of the transforms and uh, those sort of capabilities if you want. As I said before, you could also use an ESB as well, which if you've got more heavyweight uh, work to do, might be more suited to the task. But you've got to go through this stage where your end target architecture of event-driven uh, microservices that uh, are uh, self-contained, self-managed, you're going to need something to do some or or orchestration in that uh, interim. So that sort of, I don't know if it's a dirty word now, Sower, but um, you know, that's the, the sort of picture that you can get there where you've got your, uh, your API gateway fronting the interfaces from the orchestration uh, of the ESB. Um, in that scenario, to move to the full microservice architecture, that orchestration layer in the ESB, a lot of people don't like to, uh, to have that. So one option uh, is to move away from the centralized ESB and create integration-based uh, microservices. So the decentralized um, integration capabilities, it enables the orchestration, composition um, elements without, again, uh, muddying the waters of your business services that you need to maintain in a more atomic level. You want them to do what they need to do without having to worry about um, who else they uh, need to talk to directly or how to find them or all of that sort of stuff. So, that's one option, and obviously the external API gateway uh, still manages the integration microservice like uh, any other interface uh, to expose that to the uh, client applications. Um, next. Another option uh, that you've got uh, is the, you can create a microservice layer to uh, optimize your uh, user experience for different channels coming through. Um, you might need to have modified data sets, aggregate the data, uh, present it in a different way for each of the uh, applications. So that, again, gives you uh, the option to flexibly uh, do that and change those channels independently without affecting everything else. Now. If you can see through the slides, there's a problem. Who ate all the APIs? 
Yes, the API gateway is getting fatter. Now, if Mike's in the room, no comments. I don't know if he is. <laughs> so, what option do we have? Micro gateways. Um, so what we've seen so far is around a centralized gateway pattern still. You know, you've got one, one gateway that you uh, uh, deploy and configure all your APIs and quality of service on. Micro gateway, you've still then in that scenario um, scaling a platform independently from your microservices. So with the, uh, with the uh, move towards uh, managing this in a more microservice architecture manner, uh, a micro gateway uh, needs a number of characteristics. So it needs to be designed to scale, uh, run independently itself. So uh, capabilities like self-validating tokens, uh, rate limiting, uh, localized, reducing the amount of communication the gateway needs to do other than to the service it is uh, supporting. Obviously, in modern architectures, we need that container native. We want it fast boot up, uh, low memory CPU usage. In these models, the gateways tend to be handling a much, much reduced number of APIs, one, two, three, depending on what sort of uh, setup you're in, uh, rather than a centralized gateway that might handle five or 600 uh, APIs, however cleverly you've categorized and segregated that. Um, so for the models, you can have the real private jet model where you've got one microservice, one gateway, or you can have a gateway serving a bounded context. And I think that uh, sort of leads into some of the um, talks you've been seeing around the cell architecture and how a gateway can front a group of uh, services and present that uh, to the outside world. Needs to be CICD ready, so it easily fits into an automated uh, pi delivery pipeline, and um, needs to have the uh, service discovery uh, capabilities. So uh, from release 2.5, we've got our uh, micro gateway. So it doesn't work like uh, the standard gateway where you configure the gateway, deploy it, and then publish the API specs to it. Um, you use your uh, publisher and your API designer to create your definitions, create your policies that you want the gateway to host. Then you run the micro gateway toolkit, which will generate you a, um, an autonomous uh, gateway runtime. So this then gives you the ability uh, to have that decentralized view um, on the micro gateways where you've got one gateway per service and it just scales with your service pods. So the micro gateways uh, still need to support security. Um, so they can support standard OAuth 2 patterns where the micro gateway uh, can validate the token with the security token service. Um, this again is a dependency. If you go back to the pure uh, microservice architectures, and um, that means that you've still got that sort of network communication that's needed every time a gateway needs to validate a token. So that's why the recommended approach uh, for um, token validation in the micro gateway is to use the signed JWTs which means that the gateway can validate that token itself internally without calling any inter uh, external um, services. The initial stage is around getting the token the same, but the gateway doesn't have to make that call uh, to the security token service to do the validation. Um, so that makes, again, makes it far more autonomous, easier to scale, um, uh, and much better to fit into the modern architectures it also has the rate limiting um, burnt in at, uh, uh, at creation time when the runtime is created. So all of the rate limiting policies you create for your gateways are created um, using the um, publisher and store at the, uh, at the um, at design, uh, design development time. But at runtime, they're hard coded uh, into the, uh, the micro gateway. So unlike if you have the centralized gateway with traffic manager, 
This again limits any communication needed to an outside dependency. So again, trying to just follow the sort of microservice paradigm as well. And analytics. Um, so obviously, the micro gateway can run in various hosting platforms, and you can have all sorts of monitoring and tooling around that. But from an analytics and insight point of view, again, you want to try and minimize uh, the dependencies or um, inline uh, processing of uh, analytics data. So there's the capability to offload that uh, into files and upload offline for uh, the analytics uh, at a later date. So as I said, native support for container-managed um, systems um, the toolkit can generate different runtimes based on your um, preferred um, deployment mechanism, whether that be Docker, Kubernetes, or a straight VM. And um, that just enables the whole CI CD pipeline to be a lot uh, smoother. Right. Obviously, as well, uh, and I think uh, Nuon covered some of this in his talk, you've got uh, the capability to deploy across multiple environments. And the micro gateway um, can handle cross environment lifecycle uh, management by using parameters to uh, inject the correct endpoints and stuff for each of your environments as you progress through your uh, CI CD process. So the whole point of this is to try and, uh, try and remove some of the issues that uh, utilizing microservices uh, can deliver around complexity, uh, move away from the traditional orchestrations, have the, the services being able to um, choreograph themselves rather than having to rely on something else uh, to have the logic. Uh, but also removing some of the overheads and uh, additional capabilities that you don't want to repeat and build on your on your microservices. So that I think has gone a bit quick, <laughs> um, but um, the as I say, the whole point of having those capabilities to run a centralized or a decentralized model means that it fits well into whatever transitional architectures you have. You, you know, if you're Greenfield, you can set it out from scratch. If you're transitioning, you've got options to migrate slowly uh, to your desired end state. So thank you very much. I hope that was somewhat interesting. And um, if there's anyone wants to talk, I'll be around later today as well. Thank you.